And uh, hold on, making sure we're going live. And yes, we're live. What's good, ladies and gentlemen? How's everyone doing this lovely afternoon? Or wherever you're on the world's whole thing, still good. Is your boy, Dave Amel. I have an extremely, extremely special guest on this show today. Uh, the creator of My Life, a Teenage Robot. He also worked on a whole bunch of other of my childhood shows, like Dexter's Laboratory, uh, Pop-Up Girls, etc. The wonderful Rob, Rez Rob Rezeni. So thank you so Hello. much. For yes. <laughs> Hi, Ben. <laughs> Oh, look uh, at that. It even says creator of my, my life. Oh, you, you, yeah, you missed an A there, but that's good. Creator of Malather. As I Malather. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, man, thank you so much, so much for taking time out of your schedule to of do course. this interview with us. This is absolutely huge. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you for all the hard work you did for putting work into this amazing show. I think My Little Teenage Robot was a massive hit. And um, as so many years after, I haven't seen that show in so many years, been well over 10 years, but I still remember the majority of the episode that I enjoyed watching from that show. Oh, and um, it's just not that big of an impact. You probably remember more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you, you made a gem with that show. You absolutely oh, made a gem. Among many things you did, you, you just made a lot of gems, man. So I just, I couldn't be more thankful for you to be here, really, truly. I'm uh, happy to be here. Thank you for all your kind words. I will add Gem Maker to my business card now, and uh, and um, people will mistake me for some sort of someone in the jewelry trade, but that's okay. <laughs> hey man, diamonds are priceless, man. So you definitely make. Some... <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they are, man. They're priceless gems. Oh, thank man. you. I... Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you, man. Thank you so much for the childhood. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add before we get on to the questions? Because I know a lot of viewers will definitely have a few questions. Oh, we're right into questions. Oh, well, that's good. Um, no, I mean, it's it's a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions as best as I can and as best as I can remember. All righty, man. All good. All good. So I guess we'll get into the first question then. And that is, how did My Life as a Teenage Robot start? Wow. Uh, well, it started as a pilot, much like many cartoon shows that I've worked on. Um, uh, actually, it's a bit of a I've told this story many times. I'll try and do it abbreviated, but people sometimes don't still don't know, even though I've said this on many, many occasions. But mm -hmm. um, I was at Hanna-Barbera doing a short called Mina and the Count, which I wanted to be my uh, my show. Um, I was uh, working beside uh, Gundy Tarkovsky and Craig McCracken, who both did pilots for Dexter's Lab and Powerpuff. And we were all friends from school and all working together at Hanna Barbera. And I wanted Mina. Mina and the Cat was my um, my uh, student film, and I wanted to push that as a show. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I did one pilot uh, with that uh, at uh, Hanna Barbera. It didn't ever go. It went no, went no further there. Um, but uh, Fred Seibert, who was the president of Hanna Barbera at the time, um, moved over to Nickelodeon, and he had another pilots program he was doing there. And he said, "Hey, I want to bring you over. I want to do more with Mina. I think Mina should be a full on show," which was my dream. So mm -hmm. I moved over to Nickelodeon. Um, I did some other pilots first for legal reasons because it mm -hmm. had to be untangled from Hanna Barbera. And then when Mina became available, I was slated to do six more uh, shorts with Mina as part of the OEF oh yeah, Cartoons program at Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up doing five of them, and uh, Nickelodeon didn't want the the sixth. Uh, they did not like the show or, or the pilot or the stories. I was doing with the little girl and the vampire. They were creeped out by their relationship. Even though it was completely innocent, they thought it was weird that a uh, little girl and a, a vampire were hanging out together. So anyways, um, I thought mm -hmm. Fred would give that slot away. He didn't. He gave it to me. Uh, I pitched him a few ideas. One of them turned into the idea for a teenage robot. And I did the pilot for teenage robot in that first that sixth slot that I was given. It was the last thing I did as part of Oh Yeah Cartoons. And um, it didn't get picked up for three years. But I did the pilot. I left Nickelodeon. I went and worked on um, Family Guy briefly. I did a couple, really? a couple episodes of Family Guy, and then I headed back to what was now Cartoon Network and okay. worked with Gendy and Craig again on the end of Powerpuff and the start of Samurai Jack. And then three years later, my show got picked up, and I went back to Nickelodeon to work on it. Awesome. And I didn't, pitch, I didn't pitch anything. I never pitched it to any execs. I wrote a very short Bible explaining what I thought the show could be like, mm -hmm. and uh, then they just they picked it up. Uh, there was stuff happening behind the scenes I was unaware of, but I was called by Fred Seibert again, and he said, I think they're going to pick up your show. And I said, I I doubt that. <laughs> he, turned <laughs> out, he turned out to be right. I turned out to be wrong. And uh, yeah, and we went, I went back and started up the show. That's awesome. That's awesome. So they really like enjoyed the idea of like a, a robot trying to fit in with humans and have what's essentially like a, a Green Lantern where she can have anything at her disposal. Just from yeah, her, her transforming whatever. ability gives her pretty much anything uh, that we yeah. need her to do. 
Okay. I've always found that the most fascinating aspect of the show, but yeah. Thank you. No problem, man. Thank you. Uh, I guess we'll get to the next question then. And the next question is, what were you looking for in bringing these characters to life? Um, okay. Uh, that's a strange question. I mean, that's strange. Just, I'm not quite sure what, what was I looking for? I was looking for an entertaining show that people would enjoy. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I pitched a lot of ideas at that point when I came up with Teenage Robot. I'd done the mean as I, 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 um, as I already mentioned, there were four other ideas that I did the first season of Oh Yeah. I did a pilot for four different ideas. They were very, everything was different, very varied. I was very young and full of different ideas. And um, I really wanted to have a show. I wanted, really wanted as a career goal to have my own show. And that was, you know, that was, we were kind of the first uh, generation for that to kind of start to happen again after a long period where original shows weren't really given to our artists to do. But, um, uh, you know, John, John Cuffaclusi and, and, and the other initial Nicktoons, um, Doug and, um, and Rugrats, they kind of were the, uh, the, um, the first vanguard of like creator driven show and John Kirk Lucy ran Stimpy more so than anything else. Cause he was a very singular had a very singular vision. It was very much John's show. Mm -hmm. um, so when Gendy got a show and Craig got a show, I thought I want to have my own show. So I had a bunch of ideas floating out there, but um, I mean, I'm glad it was teenage robot. I wish it had been Mina, but I was glad it was teenage robot because I think teenage robot of any of the ideas I came up with was the most open and the, had the most legs, had the most possibility to mm -hmm. expand and do do lots of things with it um mm -hmm. and so what i was looking for bringing the character's life was to make a fun show about a teenage girl that also happened to be a robot i mean we're exploring you know themes of what you know themes of uh, your teenage years what it means to be a teenager what it means to um be looking to your peers for acceptance and not necessarily finding it and like struggling with the idea that you have to be you have basically you have to be in love with yourself before anybody else is going to love you. Um, which for Jenny was a huge struggle because she is so yeah. different than everybody around her. She wanted to be like everybody else. And that was really the, that was really the driving force behind the show was her emotional struggle mm -hmm. and hopefully emotional growth as she kind of learns to accept herself and learn, you know, because she's incredibly awesome. She's a super powered robot. She's absolutely the of earth. She, but she can't see that. All she can see is, her faults, which, you know, all of us kind of, I think, go through that journey as teenagers yeah. to yeah. one extent or another. I don't know, you know, even those like confident bullies, maybe they were, maybe they were super confident in high school and they thought they were in love with themselves and that's why the rest of their life was a disappointment. But I feel like even the most outwardly confident teenager is still struggling with those kind of issues. Um, and that was really yeah. kind of the focus of the show um, from an from a, from a emotional and, and theme standpoint. I okay. Hope I hope that answers the question. I no, that was a beautiful answer, absolutely. And now that you really mentioned it, I think you're 100 percent right now that I'm really thinking about it. It really was a journey of like self-acceptance, like self, like self-worth and kind of discovering yourself, even though you're like it's a it's a prime example of you're so different, but you can still fit in. And I take okay. that I think Jenny was probably the most human being out of pretty much all the humans in the show, ironically. Like she was just, she had a lot of personality for a robot. And I think that's what a lot of people really took away from it is like mm -hmm. so much personality. Like she acts how a teenager should act. She had the responsibility, but yet she's still trying to find her place in the world after being a robot. That's why she tries to, she, like an episode where she had those giant ears with the earrings, mm -hmm. uh, trying to make her make her exoskeleton so, so that she can become a human. It was just like, she doesn't need to be all that, just be herself. and. I think that's an absolutely beautiful message. So I think that's that's what I think. Hopefully, a lot of people took away from that. I definitely I took so. away. That was that was yeah. the that was the uh, that was the the goal. Um, you know, and yeah. you try and be subtle with these things and not hit over hit the audience over the head with them. So yeah, uh, especially when you only have eleven minutes in any story to to get to get uh, to get there. When we did the special Escape from Cluster Prime, we had a we had like a bigger canvas to kind of explore those core issues with her. And mm -hmm. that's, I think that's the episode where she does experience a little bit of emotional growth because it's hard, you know, uh, in today's media landscape, we have all these like series that like have limited number of episodes and the characters do change and there's a big arc. And I would have loved to do any of that stuff with Teenage Robot, but back when I was doing the show in the early 2000s, like that stuff was frowned upon. The idea was like, you want to have a show that anybody could dip into any episode, understand what's going on not be confused, not be like, wait, what's happening? Why are, there, why are these two characters mad at each other? Oh, well, because in three episodes back, they did blah, blah, blah. Like, so you kind of can't really, you weren't allowed to do those kind of big, um, those big arcs or big character development stuff. So you kind of have to 
really uh, squeeze it in in the in the margins, so to speak, and get a little okay. bit of, get a little bit of it in there when you can. Um, and it's hard okay. for to uh, today's audience maybe doesn't know that, but that was the case back in the day. I never knew that was a thing. Like, uh, like to think about it now, it's just like, okay, so you really want to get her growth, but you still want to keep that kind of fun, entertaining, exciting side, but but you still want to squeeze in some room for growth development, which I think that should be the case with any show that anyone makes. Like, that's something people need to see as we all age. The characters as well should age as well. So yeah. I think that's a that's yeah. an essential part for pretty much any kind of show or movie or anything that's going on. So I mean, it's certainly something that is is assumed in today's ent entertainment environment, but wasn't was yeah. exactly the opposite for cartoons at least. In live action shows, you had that all the time, and the prime um, the one of the prime um, mo um, um, what am I, I'm looking for um, inspirations for the show was Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which was yeah you know about a teenage girl who's a, who's basically a superhero and. Um, but it doesn't want all those, doesn't sure she wants those responsibilities, struggles with her role all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, and in that show, like Buffy defeated a big bad every season, that big bad was gone. And like, she moved on to the next thing and they had a history and they had continuity and stuff. And I would have loved to have been able to do that. But at the time we weren't, we weren't allowed to. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of at that time period where people just want to see action and fun and not really, don't really care as much about the growth of the character, yeah. which and I think I think the fact that the anime, like that, I credit anime with a lot of like allowing um, animation to branch out in that way because as anime became more um, common on, in, and more of it was on American television screens, like audiences got used to the idea that like oh there is going to be a continuing story and I've got to pay attention, I should watch this from the beginning, or mm -hmm. otherwise get caught up online with it and stuff. So. Um, yeah, things changed just a little too late for me to be able to implement any of those things. Yeah, yeah, I understand that, but it, for, for for what for what it is, it's still it's still great. So I just I would love to thank have you. seen more. You're, thank, thank you so much, but yeah, I would love to have seen a lot more of that growth, especially now. Like you know, I think that's something a lot of people should just take away from that. So, all right, so I think we should get to the next question. Question three: How did Nickelodeon react to when you pitched the idea, pitch uh, my life as a teenage robot to them for the first time? Well, again, like I'm re I really never pitched it as a show. It kind of was snuck in <laughs> under the radar because, like, basically, I had this sixth slot, and I thought Fred Seibert, the producer of the pilots, would would give it to somebody else. Would give it to either Butch, who was working on Fairly Odd Parents at the time, or or uh, or uh, Larry Huber, who was working on Talks on the time. Both of those became shows, um, mm -hmm. but he gave it gave it for me and allowed me to like come up with another idea. So I did the pilot. I heard that the execs liked it, but I never had any meetings about it while I was still at Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Fred Seibert said, like, if you want to go somewhere else, you know, they may pick this up as a show. They may pick it up, um, you know, two months from now, maybe years before they pick it up as a show. If you want to go somewhere else, go somewhere else. If they want to do your show, they will get you back at Nickelodeon. You will come back here and work <laughs> uh, uh, on your show when they pick it up. And he was right. Cause it took them close to three, I mean, over three years to pick it up as a show. So, yeah, um, I never pitched it. I had one. There was one exec that I had um, that I had some interaction with who was a champion of the show. Um, I did the Bible uh, at her request mm -hmm. um, and then she left Nickelodeon. So I thought the show was dead. And the next thing I knew, I was getting calls from a Nickelodeon exec saying your show's picked up. So um, I guess they liked it. <laughs> but I honestly <laughs> never pitched it. I never really pitched it to them. I never pitched the show. I just I wrote what I thought the show could be like. I'm sure somebody or many, many somebody's read that little mini Bible, but that was it. Yeah. That was it. Okay. That's fascinating. All right. Uh, this one's kind of a lengthy question, so I apologize. Uh, Janet, uh, Janet, why? Why? I apologize. I'm bad with names. So my apologies. Yeah. Provided the voice of Jenny Waitman at J9 and brought a lot of charm to the character. What made her stand out during the audition process and what was it like working with her? I, I really don't remember the audition process for, uh, for Janice. It was mostly just the voice quality that she had. I thought it was, um, it was a different. Um, she was she wasn't a teenager, teenager, teenager when we when we cast her, but she was young, mm -hmm. and it, she had a very young sounding voice. And she didn't have to stretch in any way to change her voice, um, like a lot of um, a lot of the other auditions. I think really were putting on a voice, and this was just her natural voice that she was using. And I thought that mm -hmm. was an advantage because for the main character, I wanted her to sound natural, and um, mm -hmm. um, so that was really what made her stand out. And she was a joy to work with. I loved working with her. She was sweet. Um, I can be very demanding when it comes to a report <laughs> session because I hear the lines in my head in a certain way and I want to make sure that they're delivered that way. Um, mm -hmm. 
and so like I would really put her through her paces and uh, and and make her um, make her do it over and over again sometimes. Um, um, <laughs> but like I'm I'm very lucky that I did cast her because uh, we ended up doing an episode where um, Jenny loses her language disc and she can only speak Japanese. And Janice was yeah. fluent in Japanese. I mean, we kind of designed the episode around the fact that she was fluent in Japanese. So. Oh, so she so that was the same voice actor, uh, Janet. Yeah, yeah, no, that was Janet. Okay, she, she did all the Japanese, and she um, and she translated most of the stuff. Like we had someone come in and translate the dialogue that we wanted to do, and then during the session, Janet Janice was like, "That's not quite right. You would probably say it like this," and she adjusted the lines based on her own knowledge of Japanese and how like someone would actually in conversation say what we were we wanted her to say. Mm -hmm. um, so it was great. It was a great experience. Um having her do that and uh and um yeah i loved working with her she was she was a lot she was very sweet very sweet young woman and uh and very um game to um <laughs> allow me to torture her with many 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 <laughs> but it sounded like man she, she exceeded expectations because i think she did a fantastic job so thank you yeah i was very happy i was very uh happy with her um you know uh the the hardest thing and this is hard for every <laughs> hard for everybody um who's a voice actor is to laugh naturally um so she really sometimes struggled with laughing, but I, I know the fans really love her laugh. So I think in the end it worked out, but like, I really yeah. think, like she'd laugh and it would be very demure and very cute, which worked a lot of the time, but sometimes I really needed her to like do a belly laugh or guffaw or like do a huge laugh. Yeah. You know, especially I'm thinking of the episode where she has some, she gets feeling and she's ticklish all of a sudden. Uh, I yeah. really had to push her because there was so much laughter in that episode. And I kept like, I kept like pushing her to laugh harder and harder and harder. <laughs> um, so again, I did torture her occasionally, but I think it worked. That's out funny. <laughs> you did something right though, because that that was a great performance. But yeah, so I guess my question is: Was that the case with the uh, the person, the people who played Tucker and uh, Brad as well? Like, were they also like young adults or? Uh, well, they weren't as young as they appeared. Yeah, I mean. Um, they were both they were both in their twenties, I think. Um, but Tuck is played by an adult woman, <laughs> okay, as, as he was in the pilot, but a different adult woman. Um, uh, and um, both both her and Brad, who was a young man, unlike in the pilot. In the in the pilot, the Brad was played by a woman, which is common. Like it's common for teen boys to be played by adult women putting on a voice. Yeah. But again, I wanted to try and get a voice that was gonna uh, was gonna work. Um, and, um, the voice of the voice of Brad, like had to tweak his voice just a little bit. He just made it a little bit higher for it to be teenage sounding. So again, I really, I really, and I really pushed to get, um, get a, a man to play Brad, um, because mm -hmm. he's the only, he's the only man in the, in the, um, in the core cast of four. Um, I mean, Sheldon's played by a man as well. Um, but the, mm -hmm. like the core cast that came from the pilot, he was the only one that was going to be actually voiced by a man and just gave us flexibility having a man in the booth because he could do other voices that. Um, you know, necess not necess a woman couldn't necessarily tackle when we had like secondary voices. Um, okay. We could have him do those. Okay, interesting. Uh, so we go into the next question, which I believe you probably have already answered, but I'll, I'll just uh -oh. ask again. Uh, how did the voice actors come up with the voices of their characters? I mean, that's something that usually they come up with in the audition um, is they, they, they come in and try some things. And some, some voice actors who are very versatile come in and do like two or three different um, versions of, of, uh, of a character. Uh, Candy Milo, who is the voice of Dr. Wakeman, she is an industry veteran and was back then as well. And she's very, very versatile. So she she did a few different things. But what she came, the one that she was her favorite ended up being my favorite version of Wakeman as well. And um, mm -hmm. um, it was very different than anything else anybody had ever done. And that was the reason why I cast her, because she did something so distinctive and something I hadn't really heard before. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, they come, they do that. They How they come up with it, I don't know. You have to ask a voice actor. I don't know. <laughs> that's fair that's fair oh yeah so like uh i was actually curious like what i never knew this at the time but like i guess you had it accented a voice uh the mother Nora wakeman i just I was curious like what accent was that like is that something that you know or because i mean do, oh, she always told me that it was based on um a character from um it was kind of a combination of um something else and and a character from um uh the beverly hillbillies which is a super old sitcom uh, there's a oh. character called Mrs. Drysdale on that show. I think I'm mm -hmm. or is, no, Mrs. Mr. I mean, I think I'm getting the character name wrong, but she's the um, I should know. I wouldn't have if 20 year old would have known uh, me would have known this in a second. Um, but she's um, she's the assistant to the banker that uh, that the Beverly Hillbillies care that like had the Beverly Hillbillies had their money with, and uh, 
I don't know if the bankers called Mr. Drysdale. I can't remember now. I think it was Mr. Drysdale. But anyways, he's, she's the assistant, and she just had this very funny voice and um, candy kind of voice, the based the voice of uh, Doctor Wakeman on off that off that classic uh, sitcom character. Ah, oh, okay, okay, that's funny. I haven't watched that sitcom in a long time, but now that it, uh, neither have I. Did. But it was on all the time in my childhood. So <laughs> fair enough. I'm trying to think, it's gonna kill me that I can't remember the character's name, but maybe <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Okay, so I guess the next question would be, who is your favorite uh, boy? Who is your favorite character? If it's Jenny, who's your close second? Yeah, I mean, I, it's hard. I, I this scared. This 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 um this uh, question's always difficult because, uh, like, a, a parent, you don't want to say you love one child uh, more than the other. But um, yeah, I mean, it's probably Jenny. But who's my close? I don't know if there's a close second. Um, Tuck was the easiest to write for. Um, mm -hmm. Tuck was always a goofball and always um, uh, it could be a jerk. Uh, he was always meant to be the comedy relief character, so it was very easy to write for him. I, I do like Tuck a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, of the villains, I'm uh, I love all the villains a lot. I have a personal spot in my heart for um, Vexus because she was voiced by our Eartha Kitt, who's really our only continuing celebrity on the show. Um, okay, uh, and I got to talk with Eartha Kitt, who I love. She's uh, she was one of the cat women on the old Batman 1960s show and did tons of stuff. She's a legend. Um, oh, if wow. you don't know who she is, look her up. But um, mm -hmm. I got the. She was in New York, so most of the times I just got to record her on the phone. But I did get to visit her in New York once and record her live once, and it was a real thrill to meet her. And I'm not much of a. I'm not much of a. Uh, um, a celebrity uh, fanatic, but it was a real pleasure to have Eartha Kid on the <laughs> show. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I've been talking. I you know all my all the characters were fun. Um, Tuck was the easiest to write for, so that might be why he might be one of my favorites because I never <laughs> had a problem coming up with jokes and gags, and nobody else did either. Did have stuff to do with with Tuck. Um, okay, so that that's always that's always useful to have a character that you're not struggling with. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's just instantly gettable, and you get him, and you know what to do with him. So that's fair. Uh, to go back to what you're saying about who uh, um, Nora Wakeman's voice, how she was inspired by a friend of mine here actually said uh, somewhere like was it Jane or Jill. From the Beverly Hill for Beverly Hill. Oh Hillbill yeah, and, and, yeah. You know what? I think they used to call her Miss Jane. I'm trying to think okay. what her last name was. Uh, so it, so it'd be the bank. Uh, he also said the bank girl from Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah, that's the bank girl, but she's not really a girl. She's kind of a middle aged woman. Um, she okay. kind of has like a uh, kind of a crush on Jethro, who's the young young male hillbilly of the hillbilly family. Um, okay. but yeah, I think you're right. It's Jane. God, it should. It should the the name should come to me, but um, I can't mm -hmm. think of it. I, I don't, okay. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I mean, someone will come up with it. I'm sure. No, yeah, no problem. Uh, I have do have a couple questions from the from the comic section, but I want to get through just these questions first before we get into anything else. Sure. So, so uh, the next question is: My life as a teenage robot has a catchy theme song sung by Jennifer Carr. Mm -hmm. Can you share a bit about the process of selecting a singer and capturing the essence of the show in the theme song? Uh, I have to give Peter Lurie, who wrote the theme song, all the credit for that. Um, Peter was someone who had a relationship with uh, Nickelodeon, and um, they kind of they offered me a few different composers to listen to some 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 samples. And then, um, actually, people did did uh, they did auditions of the theme song. So Peter was one of them that did the audition um, did an audition, and he got the theme song based off the audition he did. And he was the one who hired Jennifer Carr to do the do to the um, do the song to do the singing. And he was, again, he was in New York. Uh, Nickelodeon had a lot of roots in New York. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just always, I dealt with him uh, remotely. I never met him, but um, we actually went through three versions of the song. The first version was much, much, much poppier. And mm -hmm. Nickelodeon was worried about it. They thought it wouldn't attract, it wouldn't be attractive to boys. It sounded, it sounded too bubblegum and too soft. So we ended up <laughs> making it harder and harder so that we, that's why we had the big <laughs> guitar, guitar riff. Uh, featured in the beginning of it so that it would be like oh it's okay boys there's a guitar um that's funny <laughs> uh, but you know really uh i don't remember there being a lot of adjustment in terms of what the based on off of the the theme that he kind of did as an audition i don't think we strayed too far from the basic lyrics and it really just we changed the sound to make it more harder sound harder edged mm -hmm. um but i think jennifer was always the voice uh maybe she wasn't she might not have been the voice in the original I think when we decided to go in a harder direction, we changed the, he might have changed the, the singer because she had like a little bit of a deeper voice than the first singer did. So, if I'm remembering quick, correctly, and I may not be. 
Um, okay, so so there were two different versions of the theme song then. There were three. Uh, there oh, three was the first three. version, which I loved, and then Nickelodeon said, it's too sweet, it's too bubblegum. We made it a little harder, and they said, no, not hard enough. And then we did the third and final version, which was the one that you hear um, on the show. Um, and again, it's not a real big difference. It's just kind of a tonal difference. But the lyrics were always the same. The lyrics never changed. Um, okay. And it was just a matter of the quality of the show, and uh, the song, and what it sounded like. Okay. Uh, just one thing. Someone in the comments section said uh, Jane Hathaway. Was that it? That's it. Jane Hathaway. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was driving me nuts. Yes, <laughs> I kept thinking Howl, and I was like, no, that's the rich guy from Gilligan's Island. These are, yeah. these are things that mean nothing. Well, if you know, if you understand them, maybe the other younger <laughs> people do too. But these are, when I grew up, you must understand, TV was a wasteland compared to today. <laughs> we that's had, true. We had about 11 <laughs> to 13 channels, uh, and you know, you were stuck with old sitcoms from the 60s and 70s, which I loved. Yeah, but like you know, so Gilligan's Island and and uh, and Bill, Beverly Hillbillies and uh, I Dream of Jeannie. These are the shows that I watched on a daily basis, and it was Jane Hathaway. Yes, thank you, thank you, whoever whoever came up with that. Okay, there's also another question here from a good buddy of mine. I know we said this. Uh, I was going to read the comment section after I go through our initial thing, but since we're kind of on this topic, I'll just get this sure. one out the way, and I will get to the rest of them later. Okay. Um, a buddy, buddy of mine says, "Is there another? Is there other versions available on Blu-ray or DVD? Other versions of the show? Uh, I think other versions of the theme songs. Oh, Pro I don't yeah. think so. No, I don't think they've ever been released. They've never uh, been released. Okay. No, I don't think so. I mean, there's a <laughs> the show is a niche show you know it wasn't a huge hit when it came out so like uh, nickelodeon doesn't really doesn't really promote it or mar market it in any way <laughs> so the <laughs> idea that like alternate versions of the theme song would be out there it's a bit of a stretch no i'm sorry um i don't even know if i have them on i don't think i have them on in a, in a format that will play still i probably have them on a disc from, from 20 years ago that probably won't play in a modern computer um so i, <laughs> I maybe peter lurie has them somewhere he probably saves everything i could try and I haven't talked okay. to him in years, but uh, I don't think the original version. Uh, I can, I you know, I have to dig in the back of my closet. But don't, don't, don't anybody hold your breath for that to show up anytime soon. All right, uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie, I'm, I'm actually super curious to hear the other versions of the song. I love the weird. first. I really love the first version, but I, yeah, you know, I, I, I love. I, I got used to the final version as well. That now it's all I can hear in my head. Okay, I, I'm super curious to hear what that oh, sounds like. But yeah, sure, sure, sure. If I can find it, I will. I will put it out there, perhaps. All right, definitely, absolutely, absolutely. I would love that. Uh, and the question number eight: What is your favorite uh, episode and least favorite episode of My Lots of Teenage Robot? Uh, this is another question I got a lot. Though I don't usually get the least favorite part, so I'm going to start there. Let's start with the negative before we get to the positive. My least okay. favorite episode is the football episode, which got huge ratings when it came out for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I am not a football fan. I'm not. Well, I was a football fan. I used to watch the Bears, which was when I was growing up, a big loser team in Chicago that never won anything. Luckily, they finally won and at the Super Bowl when I was in college. But I've mm -hmm. never been huge into sports. Um, but you know, uh, you are always scrounging around for ideas, and we had a sports themed uh, idea, so we went for it. But I always felt like a bit of a charlatan doing a football episode when I really wasn't a big sports fan or a big uh, a big football fan. Um, so it's my least favorite episode. I, it did well in the ratings and it actually does well when it, when it was repeating, it also did. It was okay. So people like it. And obviously I know a lot of people love sports, so just not my cup of tea. So that was my least favorite episode. And also getting the board done was really, was a bit of a, was a bit of a, an ordeal, but, um, so that's my least favorite. Favorite episode is tough. Um, I always kind of come to the same, uh, few episodes. Um, I like the one where she can only speak Japanese. Um, that's one of my favorites. Um, yeah. Escape from Cluster Prime really isn't an episode. It's more than that. It's the half hour special. But I do have a lot of um, I'm a lot of pride in that because I'm happy with how it turned out. And um, mm -hmm. um, my board artists really everybody was all hands on deck on that because um, we did it in four different parts. And um, everybody um, really put brought their A game to use a sports metaphor for someone who doesn't like sports. Uh, and uh, you know, really knocked it out of the park on that one. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of that episode. Um, another one that I um, like uh, was Around the World in 80 Pieces, which is the one where uh, <laughs> Jenny gets split up. We introduced a new uh, villain, Krakus, in that episode, our goofiest villain. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, the original idea and the outline was written by my wife, Tracy Royce. And so, really, uh, yeah, she uh, she uh, 
a little bit of nepotism there, but well-deserved nepotism. She came up with a good idea and I had her write the outline. And mm -hmm. um, I believe uh, one of my favorite board artists, Bernie Peterson, did the board on that and did a great job, really knocked it out of the park. Uh, I got to get a few of my um, a few um, of my own jokes in there and people seemed to like those jokes. Uh, so <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was something we hadn't quite, we, you know, we really emphasized um, the physical parts of Jenny's body in the first season. Then we kind of got away from that for a little bit. And then we yeah. kind of came back to it. And I kind of enjoyed her being kind of um, split all apart in that way. Um, the next thing that happened, I think, as the series went on, and maybe, you know, people disagree, everybody will have their favorite season, but we kind of got used to the characters and were able to push them and make them all a little bit goofier and, um, and, and push their, their personalities a little bit as we went along. Um, mm -hmm. And that's always fun when you kind of, you kind of hone in on who the characters are and you can, you feel um, relaxed enough to, to um, kind of push them a little further. And it was fun. It was fun coming up with another member of um, of the cluster, um, um, and and having uh, having him to uh, play around with because um, he was he was he was fun. I wish we'd been able to do more with Krakus, and we had planned okay. to, but we didn't get we didn't get a fourth season, so we couldn't do anything more uh, more with any of the characters we wanted to do more things with. Okay, I will have to say, since we're on the subject, I would say one of my favorite episodes that kind of stand out was when um, Jenny was, uh, she wanted to know what it was like to have a dream. Her mother instilled a dream oh, to yeah. her head, and she kind of abused it. She got water, and then she just kind of saw everything in her dream as a monster. She just ran luck around the city. Yeah, that was that was a, that's a great yeah. one. And, uh, um, uh, I like that episode, too. Um, uh, that I have to give kudos to my art director, Alex Kerwin, who I haven't mentioned yet, and I should, because he's really, the he gets the lion's share of... Um, uh, credit for how teenage robot looks he is the he is the person who really um solidified how it looked and yeah uh, in that episode like we kind of decided we were going to pay homage to other artists that we liked like dr seuss and, and windsor mckay and the dreams all kind of are in different different styles uh to kind of pay homage to um to uh, you know creators and stuff that we liked that's awesome. I'm not gonna say, I was gonna think I'm gonna say it was a lot of a lot of uh, Dr. Seuss influence in that uh in that whole uh, cartoon. Oh, yeah, it's a really complete Dr. Seuss ripoff, the final dream. It's meant it's meant to yeah. be a ripoff of all these different styles, <laughs> but you know, like a leg legally, legally okay ripoff. <laughs> okay, okay. I was actually gonna say now that I kind of think about so. it, I'm like I, Dr. I was, now that, don't sue me, it's 20, 20 years later. It's too late. Yeah. <laughs> your limitations. I was actually gonna say now that you're thinking about it, because I did think it was Dr. Seuss at the time, but it never occurred to me, wait. It's, isn't this considered copyright? Because I know copyright at the time I was a kid, but you know, I was I mean, like, not, I was... you know, if you're paying homage to something, you're you're yeah. allowed to you're allowed to um, pair yeah. something yeah, yeah. as long as you're not passing passing it off as either original or or as Dr. Seuss himself, like as if Dr. Seuss had created. We weren't to. If Dr. Seuss was like that growing up, I probably would have loved him more because I'm not gonna lie, the whole Dr. Seuss thing where everybody was like turning into a monster and then she just destroyed them in her dream. That, that that episode stood out to me. I feel like I can remember like that's probably the ones I vividly remember the most, even after well, like, very almost... visually striking and there's lots of lot going on in that episode, which is a lot of fun for yeah. the audience, but also crazy for the production team. Because rather than oh, design, <laughs> rather than design one episode, you have to design five episodes in one. So yeah, we tried yeah. To, try to not do that too often, but we did. A, we did. We did really run um, our design team ragged in most episodes. Very <laughs> must, show. It was worth it because that's probably one of the best episodes in my thing, and that oh, was so uh, that was so fun to watch. I guess another set of episodes were the hear no evil, see no evil, and I think feel no evil. I forgot the mm -hmm. third one. Those were those are episodes that stood out to me too. Uh, at, there were a whole bunch of episodes I can go through the list, but yeah. Um, the next question before I get to it, I do want because this kind of relates to a question that someone else wrote in the chat, a really good buddy of mine. Let me just get to his right now. He says, Right here, hey Rob, thank you for everything. Would you consider a reboot or refresh taking on the show, or is that door closed forever? Uh, and that, that I'd say never say never because uh, things always change, and there's nothing in the works right now, except and maybe people don't know this, I am. Um, writing a new teenage robot story. Really? Uh, starting. Oh, you didn't know. Okay. Well, Tuesday on no. Tuesday. Yes. On Tuesday. Um, if you sign up, uh, go to robrenzetti.com mm -hmm. um, and sign up for my newsletter on Tuesday, August first, which is which is actually twenty years to the day since it premiered originally. Um, the show premiered August first, two thousand three. August first, twenty twenty three. There mm -hmm. will be a new series. I mean, new series. I wish a new series, but no, a new story with Jenny and uh, some of the other characters from Teenage Robot. If not, not everybody will appear, but um, okay. maybe like a, it's a, basically you'll get like a chapter uh, per week through the newsletter. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be like serialized, like an old Charles Dickens story where it appears like a chapter at a time. 
Okay. Um, the first uh, the first chapters out on Tuesday, and um, and then about every once every week, I may skip a few weeks if I get behind. But uh, right now, I've got um, I've got uh, four chapters uh, written already, um, and you'll get a chapter every week. It's not a comic; it's a prose story. But Alex Kerwin is going to be doing some illustrations for it. So. The first chapter has a beautiful, beautiful piece of artwork done by Alex Kerwin. It's the first time he's drawn Jenny in, nice. one, in a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you will get like an illustrated uh, story um, uh, for Teenage Robot. And um, it's going to go on for a little while. It'll go on for a few months. Um, it's a, a, I've, the, the chapters have kind of expanded as I've gotten into writing it and started writing characters again, like things that I thought would be quicker are, are turning into whole chapters because of, uh, you know, I'm having... Sheldon and Brad speak for the first time and they haven't spoken in 20 years or, you know, a little less than that, 16 years. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's been fun and uh, it'll go live uh, this Tuesday. So you can, you can read a new story of the teenage robot. Um, you know, if there were ever a season four, maybe this would be an episode or two on season four, um, but it's a different format. It's a different thing, but it is uh, okay. Hopefully, hopefully it feels uh, consistent with the show that everybody remembers. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully everybody enjoys it. But uh, I've got other ideas for other stories. Right now, I'm just going to do this one. Uh, okay. And uh, you know, you just have to sign up for my newsletter, and you, you can you can you can read it for yourself. Oh, I, uh, I'm already on top of it right now. I already have my link <laughs> open, so be sure to as we no, speak. As we speak, I'm doing it right now because I really want to see that. I'll put my email and everything later, but I'm. I'm psyched for that. I think everyone else in the chat is excited too. Hey guys, uh, thank you so much for posting the link in the in the in the in the in the chat below. Everybody, if you really yeah, want to see, you. please please sign up to his newsletter. If you guys really want to catch up on the the, the series coming up, please go do it right now <laughs> as we speak. And uh, that's something I'm gonna do as soon as we're finished here. I I'm super excited. I really can't wait to see what you got going on, man. I'm I'm, I'm hyped. Like I'm I have a big smile on my face. Oh like, good. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. This is a surprise for you. I, I it is. I'm it's hard excited. because you know. Uh, you you talk about it on social media and you feel like you're really um you're really hectoring people because you keep bringing it up but I know people don't see that <laughs> stuff because there's so much out there um you know to to see on a daily basis so I'm happy to yeah uh, yet again but yeah I'll keep uh, I'll keep promoting it but yeah it'll 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 be you can start with chapter one on uh, Tuesday absolutely like i think we're all will so i'm super excited for that thank you so much for sharing that with us and guys of I hope you're all excited and I hope, i'm sure the chat is all excited too like i said links in the links in the links in the chat down below click on it signs up to his newsletter and uh and just wait till then man i just as i can say i'm super I'm excited a couple days. exactly exactly i'm excited for that all right so we'll get to the 10th question since we pretty much answered number nine and that is what some things? What's something you would do differently if you could go back and rework uh, my life as a teenage robot? Uh, well, I, I've already said, but I'll say it again. I basically would give. Uh, I'd have like continuity. I'd have longer stories. Um, you know, uh, you know, season long arcs similar to what Buffy did. Um, you know, big season long stories that we then wrap up. Um, you know, I'd have more character development. I have the characters change rather than kind of resetting every every episode. Um, I do what is really um, a more modern show. Um, it is something I would have loved to have done back in the day. But like I said, when I was doing the show, it was not allowed, basically. Um, so that was how, how I would change it. Um, you know, the okay. characters, I think, wouldn't necessarily change. I wouldn't, if I were to reboot it, I wouldn't make it like it's 20 years later. And, you know, Brad's got a job as a middle manager at a local, you know, uh, big box electronics store. No, they're, they would, it, the story I'm telling in the, in the newsletter and the stories I would tell would be like, I'd pick up where the series left off. They'd be teenagers because we didn't really get to complete those story arcs that I, you know, wanted to do the bigger stuff mm -hmm. that I wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. So if it got picked up again, I think we'd just kind of um, start where we left off and 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 make it slightly different in terms of like doing bigger stories, doing longer stories, mm -hmm. um, doing things that don't um, wrap up after eleven minutes all the time. Yeah, yeah. I think nowadays, I think a lot of people would have loved to have seen like more of a. I think like we talked about before, a lot of people are more akin to like having more of a story instead of just all action like we see in anime. Because anime nowadays is like very, it's very balanced with the action and then the mm -hmm. story and then the character development. I'm sure a lot of people would have loved to see that. I thought this, I mean, the show was great as it is. I wouldn't change it for a thing. But I would say- Well, that's because like, you can't. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was created and it's already done. So you can't change exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. No, I wouldn't change it either way. I would like- I'm actually, I probably after this, I'm probably going to rewatch the series from start to finish anyway. Well, you better. So you should have done will. that before you interviewed me. 
I didn't need to. I, I already had. I know, you, you didn't need to because you got everybody asking questions for you. <laughs> well, it's questions that they want. So, you know, I, no, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're good. You're, you're good. You're I'm good. You're teasing you're good. you. I'm sorry. I'm not teasing you. No, 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 no. no. You're, you're totally fine. Uh, you're totally fine. <laughs> and okay. So, this is the last question we have here. And then we can move on to the chat. And this is uh, What's it like seeing fans that grew up with teenage robots still enjoy it as much, if not more than 20 years later? Well, I haven't been able to actually spy on anybody watching the show 20 years later and enjoying it, but I am glad that. Everybody <laughs> remembers the show and, and seems to like it um, and, and seems to have affection for it. Of course, um, you know, like I said, it wasn't a big rating success when it came out. But um, the fact that it's remembered 20 years later is, uh, you know, that's very special to me. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of shows that sink in obscurity, into obscurity. And uh, it was rather obscure to begin with. So it wasn't, I always <laughs> assumed it would just mostly be forgotten. But, um, you know. Again, like I don't, I don't know how many people actually remember, but there's a certainly a strong fan community, and and I love interacting with them on social media, and I love the, all the attention that everybody um, pays, and all the fan art that everybody does. I look at fan art all the time. I never look at fan fiction. I should let everybody know that um, uh, because I thought someday I might re, re reintroduce the characters like I'm doing in the newsletter, and I didn't want to be accused of taking anybody's ideas. So if I have an idea that seems similar to yours, it's because we're think great minds think alike. And uh, but I've mm -hmm. never read any fan fiction, uh, but I do look at fan art all the time, and I love seeing all the fan art. Um, and there's some mm -hmm. amazing some amazing artists out there doing teenage robot stuff. Yeah, um, and uh, I really love seeing all that. It's great. Um, and I mostly I most I'm on Instagram every once in a while, but I'm mostly on Twitter. Um, I I decided I would, you know, take my passage on the Titanic of social media. As it you know, <laughs> slowly sinks from the iceberg, that is Elon Elon Musk. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm on there. I'm on there till the bitter end. I'm like a musician. That's funny. I'm a musician playing the violin on the deck, going down with the ship. I'll stay nearest, there as long. Stay as there as long as I can. <laughs> nearest to God, nearest to God to whatever the song. Yeah, was. Exactly. yeah. So you know, I can. Uh, you can find me there most days doing something, commenting on something. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So That's yeah, awesome. no, I, it's it's. It's not anything I could have predicted that 20 years later I would still be talking about Teenage Robot and be, yeah. you know, talking to you or talking to anybody else about it, honestly. Just, yeah. you know, um, so um, it's exciting for me. And uh, here's a little uh, visual thank you directly from Jenny. She says, hey. thank, she says thank you as well. <laughs> That's awesome. There you go. That is awesome. I got to buy me one of those now. Well, you can't. So cool. <laughs> uh, this was made for the this was made for the crew back in the right after the show wrapped. Uh, I, I, we were hoping Nickelodeon would produce them uh, commercially, but again, Nickelodeon has not produced any. Maybe if somebody out there, if there's a toy maker out there, give me a call. We can. Yes, can give him it. a call. We can I want, make I want... a mass, mass produced version of this stuff. Do it. Um, do it right will agree. now. There it is. Do, exactly. Do it right now. Everybody in the chat, demand it right now. We want. We want Jenny. Plus, Any I kind mean, of merch, I, mean, I do have this. I do have this. Is this is produced as well? That this is a this is a fan produced T-shirt I'm wearing. That's um, awesome. Uh, available on Threadless, I believe. Um, there's some a little a little bit of unofficial merch out there, but um, you know, I would love to. I would love to see anything commercially produced. So that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. Okay, so that is definitely all the questions I have currently. I guess we'll just look in the chat. And the first question that I see here that came up was from the Detective 96. Was Jenny going to suffer the same fate as her sisters locked away in the basement once Nora made the XJ-10? Um, uh, probably not. That was kind of always a running gag and a joke. Um, <laughs> the only thing that she was in the Christmas episode where she went renegade and, uh, you know, was basically gone for a year. You could see Wakeman was making plans for XJ-10. Um, but once uh, they were able to save Jenny and bring her back, uh, no. Uh, Jenny is the first successful of the XJ line. She would, she's not, uh, you know, for all of Wakeman's uh, criticisms of her, um, she considers Jenny to be the success uh, and the first success. Um, mm -hmm. The other XJs were all failures. Um, they're too limited in their, um, in their ability. They don't have the adaptability that she has. Um, and uh, they're all kind of more mon monomaniacal. That's why they all have kind of like, one personality trait like the seven dwarves that was always their concept was that they you know there'd be a neat one and a talkative one and a, and a brute and a, a baby and all these things um they were they were all failures but uh, jenny was a success so no she was never meant to be mothballed uh, by by uh, by nora she would always have been um, always have been there okay 
By the well, way, maybe, that's awesome. maybe Nora would have made an XJ10 to help her. Yeah. Um, so that Jenny didn't always have to be the superhero. Maybe, you know, they would split the duties and that would have been an interesting set of stories. There's certainly, certainly talk and um, ideas percolating about how to use an XJ10 maybe in the future or what mm -hmm. that would be, what that could be. But we never, that, we never got off the ground with any of that. But uh, Jenny would not have been retired. I hope that, I hope that makes everybody feel a little bit better. <laughs> they're wondering i'm sure it's good that's perfect actually i will say that's another one of my favorite episodes the way she just went in with the uh with the with her sisters essentially like mm -hmm. you're a neat freak you never shut up that part had me dying by the way when i first saw it <laughs> she's telling her to shut up <laughs> yeah I love the, the, X, the xjs the other xjs were actually the idea of my first story editor mike bell who came up with that concept and uh he actually mm -hmm. did a did an early sketch of them all, um, which we which um, Alex and the other designers took uh, as inspiration, and 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 we moved forward from there. So I have to credit Mike Bellwood for coming up with that idea. It didn't literally didn't occur to me that there could be eight other XJs that came before XJ nine, which is dumb because it seems very obvious. Once you think of the idea, you're like, yeah, duh, of course. But um, you know, the the nine was always just as I was trying to come up with a uh, some sort of robot. Uh, number that Jenny could look at and say, I don't want to be called that. I want to be called Jenny. So the okay. J nine was meant to be kind of like her making her name into uh, making a human name from those, uh, those two, that letter and that number. And of course so the more, the more natural would more natural name would be to call herself Jane. But um, the ironic thing about her name is Jenny, uh, even though it's a human name, it's also a it's also something that people call um, generators, like like electrical generators. They call them Jennies. So, the ironic the ironic point was she's trying to make herself more human, but she's actually just called herself another machine name. That's um, wow. Okay, I never that wow. I don't think a lot of people knew about that. That it was another robot, but she chose an, that was another name. But it really, it's just another appliance. That's actually pretty funny. Now that I'm thinking about it. I had another question related to that, and I just and my brain just farted, so I apologize for that. But um, okay, so okay, I remember now. So you need to open the door. Is it smart? Is it smelling there now with your brain having farted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think the answer is clear right now because I finally remember. Okay. Oh, you did. Okay, good. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, okay, so actually, now was really just supposed to be a number. It wasn't meant to be like a, a final product. For like the other like xj7 xj8 essentially yeah i mean I, I it was meant to mean something like i don't know extreme justice i <laughs> what do you want? Yeah. again i just kind of came up with it and didn't really think too deeply about okay. what, what what it might be what the okay. import of it might be which is you know which is great that's why you hire other people to work on a show with you because they will bring ideas to the table that you don't have yourself so when yeah. i came up with that i was like this is great this is amazing this is like opens mm -hmm. up this whole this whole other avenue of stories and a whole new set of characters. Um, uh, and uh, I loved it. I didn't want to overdo it. I didn't want to do overdo it with the other XJs. I didn't want them to all of a sudden be like, and now we're all activated and now we're a team because that wasn't what the show was supposed to be about. So we brought them back. Okay. Sparingly, but um, I loved always having them as part of the, as part of the ongoing cast. It was great that, uh, that we had that. And that was due to Mike Bell. So thank okay. you. Okay. I was actually gonna say, like, because I it's been a while. Because there's certain numbers aspects of the show I remember, but I don't like. I, I was actually gonna ask. So, did they ever bring back the other XJs? Yeah, the they, were in, they were in. They were in two or three other episodes. Um, okay, they're actually in the final episode of the show. They're in the, the where they um they all go berserk. Um, mm -hmm. they all um they all go berserk and attack Jenny and and try and attack Wakeman and uh, Jenny has to fight her sisters. And um, and she's uh, able to conquer them. They also all um, they also um, came back in. Um, well, that's the original one. They came back a couple. They came up back at least two more times. But yeah, we did kind of use them very sparingly. But they did come back. Okay, all right, that's interesting. Okay, so now we got a question from Plants uh, One Ten Thousand. <laughs> yeah, Ten Thousand, and he says, "Okay, Rob, question time. What was the idea behind the villains' dynamic of Vexus, Gimtus, uh, Krakus? They always seem pretty incompetent together." <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. Well, you know, Vexus was Vexus. I wanted them um, when I was conceiving of the show and kind of working it out, and when I had the when I had the um, green light to do a series, but I didn't. We weren't in production yet. I had a little bit of development time, and I knew that I wanted two things for Jenny. I wanted two kinds of villains. One was um, the villains that would um, kind of um, pester her in her social life and her teenage life, which is more important to her actually. And that's where Brit and Tiff came from. Um, they were meant to be the supervillains in the social scene of her teenage high school life. 
And then I knew she needed to have an actual real supervillain like in her superhero life. And that was mm -hmm. meant to be Vexus. And Vexus is literally from Vex, uh, us. Vex means to bother or to, to you know, to, to annoy. Um, so instead of Vex me, which sounds kind of weird, uh, we mm -hmm. learned Vex us, meaning Ve Vexus was designed to vex the human race, um, mm -hmm. to, to, to be against the human race. Um, mm -hmm. And so Vexus was the first to come along. Um, actually, the first to come along was this, uh, this um, generic cluster uh, robot that came down in the um, Snowford episode and, um, and bothered Jenny, Brad, and Tuck when they were trying to have this epic snowball fight. Um, but he was the herald of things to come, and Vexus was always planned to show up uh, after after him. Um, but the idea was that there's a whole there's a whole race of these um, these robots, and so there had to be other lieutenants and other people in the command structure. So mm -hmm. Smidus was the next one to show up, um, and then Krakus came later. And the idea behind them, when they're all together being goofy, was just like, well, it's a comedy show, <laughs> and like <laughs> Vexus Vexus alone is more is you know, is basically more effective than when she has her lieutenants with her because um, they're not really great. Um, so, you know, the <laughs> idea that they are kind of goofy and, and goofy superhero super villains is, you know, it was a comedy show, so we, we tended to go for the comedy. Um, but Vexus is maybe the more serious of the three of them. And when she has a serious, you know, when she's uh, left alone, she's a little bit more, uh, more, more potent than when she has Smidus and Krakus with her. They kind of slow her down. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so another question from I can't pronounce this. I'm guessing it's Russian, but uh, oh yes, that's is, Russian, right? Yeah. So Rob, have you ever come up with a new female character in Teenage Robot but didn't include her in the story? Uh, yeah, actually, um, there was an um, again when we were in development, there was a character called the Polter the Poltergeist, uh, which was going to be a um, a dead uh, teenage ghost that had similar issues to Jenny. Um, she was, but she was like really old. She was like from a century or earlier. So she was a teenager who wanted to hang out with other teenagers when Jenny is being kind of um, rejected by all her contemporary teenagers, this teenage ghost actually wants to hang out with her, but Jenny can't stand her <laughs> because it's like hanging out with a teenager is also your grandma because she's like from a hundred years ago and she doesn't, she doesn't like the same things Jenny likes. She doesn't have the same uh, teen talk. She doesn't use the same slang. She just seems like an old person, but the ghost thing shows her still seems of herself as a teenager. Um, and she just would be there to bedevil Jenny because Jenny had no power over her. She couldn't, you can't punch a ghost. She just like mm -hmm. would punch through her. So she was not a powerful villain, but maybe the most annoying villain that Jenny would, um, would have. But at the time the show was being developed, uh, Butch was also developing Danny Phantom, and so ghosts were off the table. <laughs> so they said you cannot, uh, you you cannot have a ghost character. Um, no. So uh, the poltergeist stayed on the drawing. The draw. We actually had like a, she was in the Bible at one point. She had a. We had some rough design for her, but no, they had to, they 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 nixed that character. So that's mm -hmm. the that's the one character that I came up with that we could never use. Um, so and, so this was before or after uh, Danny Phantom came out. That it was before. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know when Danny Phantom was on the air. I know she, Danny Phantom came out like premiered maybe a year or a year and a half after Teenage Robot came out. I don't remember the exact timing, but you know, uh, Butch had been doing Fairly Odd Parents for a few years, and they wanted to see what other ideas he had, so he was developing Danny Phantom at the time. So that's why we didn't. Uh, that was in the works. It wasn't on the air yet, but they're like, no, we you, you ghosts are uh, are uh, Butch's domain. You don't get to have ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> oh well i would love to see that honestly but i can yeah i can kind of see why because it's already butch's idea and yeah so well that. Be, uh, to be fair to my ghost he doesn't get to have ghosts that was my reaction why does he get to have all the ghosts <laughs> are you telling me he's never gonna have a robot in his show i don't remember if he did or not but you know. i think he did or at least a yeah met. see yeah that's kind of unfair i mean yeah that's kind of unfair like, the ghost is not the i'm going back in time and i'm going to complain <laughs> fight for your fight for uh, ghost rights i'm gonna use my time machine that i have and go back and change things so yes oh, i will definitely. be redoing the show nice 2003 again <laughs> nice <laughs> okay so we have another question from a good friend of mine humanoid freak uh it's not a, a jenny related question but he's just curious i'll let this one slide because he's a friend of mine he <laughs> said he said uh can i ask about the concepts of the 1995 cartoon show dumb and dumber came to be 
I mean, you could ask, but you can't get an answer because I did one storyboard on that show and that was my only involvement in it. Uh, I don't know what it's crediting me with, with me on, on IMDb if it's showing, saying I was like a director or producer or something, but I wasn't. I did one storyboard. Uh, one, I storyboarded one episode of Dumb and Dumber. So I think the concept was like, Dumb and Dumber is a popular movie. Let's do a TV show about it. Um, and, uh, you know, back when it, that happened, it was kind of maybe the last time Hanna-Barbera did that, but they were, they did a lot of like, oh, this is popular. Let's do a cartoon version of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I think that was probably the only thinking behind it was, it was a popular, it was a popular movie. Let's, let's see if we can get the rights to do a cartoon show. And they did, and they did, and they did it but I wasn't really involved. So that's the best I can do for you. Okay. You know, no <laughs> okay. Uh, next question is uh, from NF animator Ra Rager. Sorry if I can't pronounce. What happens to Simpsons and Crackers after trash talk? Simpsons seems to be, seems to start doubting Vexus. So they would, so they have still followed her even after the events of that episode. I have no idea. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we didn't get that far. <laughs> a, lot <of> this, <laughs> a lot of this stuff, like, Again, we weren't allowed to do huge, uh, you know, huge uh, plan a story very far ahead. We weren't allowed to do a lot of story development. The fact that things are developing a little bit with those characters was a victory uh, for me. But like, uh, I mean, definitely I could have seen a future episode where Smytus went up against Axis. That kind of meant a cool, um, you know, villain versus villain um, idea. But um, we honestly didn't get that far. So I can't I can't say one way or another what we would have done. But, yeah, we might have done something like that with those characters. Um, but I don't know what happened to them. We didn't write it. I didn't I haven't <laughs> written it yet. Maybe when I do not, they're not the, 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 the cluster are probably not appearing in the current story I'm doing for the newsletter, but they would probably appear in a subsequent story. Um, I have some other story ideas and I think there'd be a role for them in the subsequent ideas. Um, okay. but, um, so we'll maybe, maybe we'll see what happens um, in some form, but I don't know yet. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, next question from uh, Mr. Com Mr. Cartoon Dude again. Uh, what, would it be cool to have... Huh? It would be... Yes, I'll answer for you. Yes, it would be cool if we had a Johnny Funko Pop. Um, they but, haven't made one? No. I mean, again, my show is very obscure. <laughs> again, uh, every fan that's on the... If you hears my voice, pester Funko Pop. Pester them online. Pester them at... They are on Twitter. I'm sure they're on all other social media Ask them, ask them uh, repeatedly for a Jenny Funko Pop. Maybe we'll get one someday. There's been a couple of fan-made ones where, like, someone sculpted their own Funko Pop version of Jenny, which was looked really cool. Um, and uh, I would love to see it. I would love to mm -hmm. see a Funko Pop Jenny. Uh, but again, I'd love to see any kind of Jenny and any kind of um, <laughs> any kind of uh, you know um, any kind anything really any Jenny th any Jenny thing mass produced by anybody. I would be very pleased with. Yeah, yeah. Now that now, now that now that everyone brought this up, I think we should start a petition to start making Funko Pops for sure. one of Teenage Drama. Really, really get that show more exposure to let everyone know well, how just awesome that show is. So, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, we should definitely do that. Uh, okay, we're gonna answer a couple more questions, and I want to. I don't want to like bombard you with too many questions. So we're, gonna, okay. we're just gonna do the, this last yeah, too much, two course. more. So let me just see what I have here because I'm gonna make sure everyone gets their share. Uh, just uh, give me a minute. I want to see some way. Uh, okay, we'll we'll do this one by Starband Fan. Uh, sort of a minor question, but I've been wondering this for a while. Was Kilgore based on or a parody of Invader Zim in some way? Because I immediately know that they are two are very similar on my first viewing. Uh, no, the, no, he was not. Um, he was not meant to be. Um, it's possible that the the, um, the board artist who did the first Kilgore episode, uh, Dave Thomas. Um, it's possible he was looking at Zim, but I didn't. I didn't watch Zim at the time, um, and I didn't really know anything about the uh, show that was done, was being done. We overlapped a little bit. Zim came a little bit before Teenage Robot. They were still in production when we started the show, but no, it wasn't meant to be a parody of Invader Zim. I haven't seen much of Invader Zim. I do like what I've seen, but I've never um, never had a chance to catch up with that show. Um, but of course, you know he's a he's a bombastic uh, villain who wants to destroy humanity. So I can see where the overlap would be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, of course, I think, I don't know. I know Zim is rather incompetent in the show. He, I know since we're all still here, I know he didn't succeed in destroying humanity, but I think Kilgore might be more incompetent than Zim since he's basically just a little a little toy, a little toy robot. Though he does manage to rebuild Armageddroid on his own, so who's a giant robot. I don't know how he did that, but um, so maybe he's maybe he's more potent than I'm giving him credit for. But no, That's he fair. Was, no, he wasn't meant to be a parody of Invader Zim. Yeah. 
Okay, this is gonna be the very last question. It's a question I'm actually been curious about, and this is from Humanoid Freak again. So I apologize if everybody let you know. Oh this my god, the... Humanoid Freak, you're getting too much attention. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, but this is the question I personally wanted to know myself. So you okay. guys have any right. other questions? Well, I... okay. Yeah, I greatly apologize if I didn't get to your questions that way, but I this has to be the last one. Anybody because, can you know... ask me a question, uh, tag me on Twitter and ask me a question, and I may answer it if I see your if I see it. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm I try to be good about answering questions that pop up there. You can okay. also ask me questions through my website. You can contact me um, through my website at robinsay.com. But if you right. do, you better send up for the newsletter. You better, everybody, because no, okay. I, I will, and you better do too. I'm you, straight can, up. you can always send to ask me a question without signing up. <laughs> I, I will not know whether you have or not. All right, awesome. Okay, this is the very last question, and that is, for Dexter's lab, why is Dexter the only one with an accent while his family does not? Uh, because he's made because he's put it on <laughs> because he, Dexter thinks that mad he thinks that all famous scientists have accents and therefore he should have an accent. He looks at Einstein and other you know Eastern European scientists and he thinks like well they have accents if I want to be legitimate and be thought of among these greats I need to have an accent so he has put on that accent and I don't know that he can speak without it now I think he's adopted it for so long that I think he doesn't know how to um, speak normally anymore. I, I don't uh, know. Gendy would Gendy could tell you exactly for how long he's been putting on that accent. But that is the answer that I've always heard from Gendy was that he has put on the accent. So the, it was never his accent, like and I, not only, you, it's not like he's a changeling or that he was with an Eastern European family and then like his family adopted him from Eastern Europe. As far as I know, I don't think that's Dexter's origin. You'd have to ask Gendy to be um to be more more uh, sure of the answer, but as a as a as a, a long personal friend of Gendy's and as someone who worked on the show from the very beginning, I believe that Dexter is simply putting on that accent, but that he's put it on for so long that he doesn't know how to speak straight English anymore. Um, so he's convinced that, himself that that accent that accent is legit. That's hilarious because now that I'm thinking about it, it's like why didn't his family ever question why he's talking like that? Because I've always I mean, assumed that maybe like, he's from. I mean, his parents don't question anything, right? I mean, there is a giant. That's lab true. They're underneath you know their, underneath their um their house. They're, I mean, they're oblivious as as all as all get out, but yes. <laughs> no, my God, I'm never going to unsee this now. That act is not real. <laughs> You're here first. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it's wrong. I don't know. <laughs> That's my answer, though. You want an answer? I'm giving you an answer. It, no, I accept it. That's that's perfect for me. And I hope that's a good answer for you too, you humanoid. All right, everybody. That is the final question. I'm super sorry for anyone who I didn't get to answer to. But like I said, you still have a chance to answer any questions that you have for Mr. Rob here. Please go to his uh, Twitter. Please go to his website. Please follow his uh, news um, newsletter to see more information on the Teenage Robot series. And uh, yeah, please go support him because this guy made... I, I can say so many great things about him. But you guys already know how, how much I'm gushing. But oh, wait, go ahead and say it. No, you're an amazing guy. Like, everybody, please follow keep him. Going. Keep, the, keep, the, keep it going. Keep saying good things. Just I will. I will. But I, I don't want to take too much time. But basically, guys, please All go support him. Yeah. So please go support him. Please follow his newsletter. Please ask him ask any questions. He will answer them as often as he can. And Mr. Rob, thank you so much once again for everything you've done for all our childhoods, for answering all our questions, and for taking the time out of your schedule to do this interview with us. Oh, it's well, been a colossal you. honor. Thank it you, truly Robin. has been. Uh, I had a good time. I will. I will say this. I did not invent your childhood. I, the, you don't have to thank me for your childhood. I'm happy that I was there, but you invented your own childhood. You and your friends and your family. I'm happy to have been part of the um, pop culture landscape that was there for you. But you, you, you did. Were, you, you, uh, you, you invented your own childhood. So thank, thank yourself for inventing your childhood. That's <laughs> fair. That's fair. That, I'm glad that all the children out there watched my show, though some of them at least. And I'm glad as adults are still watching it. So absolutely, so absolutely. But thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, guys, this is going to be the end of the stream. If you guys have anything you'd like to uh, count any other questions, like I said, follow him, follow his Twitter. It's going to be in the description down below. Follow our, follow our post notifications so you don't want to miss what we do. Like, comment, share, subscribe to all our social media accounts, everybody. And we'll see you guys on, on the next interview. So much love, you guys, and you all stay awesome.